Verses summarizing the parameters of the eight consciousnesses written by Tupitaka Master Xuanzang, 596 to 664 AD. And how many years from now? 1400 years from now? These verses were written approximately about 1500 years ago. Translated 1500 years ago by by um, a monk, Xuanzang, in the Tang Dynasty of China. And we all well know that Xuanzang was the monk 1,500 years ago who traveled from China to India, stayed in India for 17 years as an overseas student in India, learned philosophy, language, Sanskrit, Pali, and all that, and then after 15 years brought back volumes of sutras back to China in an expedition back to China. The king of China established a temple for him as a translation academy in which they accommodated close to about 900 students to translate whatever he brought back from India to China. So that's the reason why maybe um, in the history of mankind, the most resourceful Buddhist literature is in China. It's written in Chinese because there were, there were a lot of monks, quite a few monks who travel and translate and brought back. So 1,500 years ago, there was, a, uh, there was already an overseas student from China to India, a monk. And he traveled on land. You know how long he traveled to be a student? How long, how much time you take to travel from India, from, from China to India 1,500 years ago in order to study in, in, in India for 17 years? How much time it took for traveling? Three years. Now it took about, say, 13 hours to fly to India, to fly to India. In the ancient days, it took three years across the mountain, across the bridges, across the streams, across the desert. And not a lot of people make it though. He is one of the many monks who travel from China to India. Only a few make it. A lot of them die in the desert, sickness or weather because of the, of the storm, snowstorm, desert. You know what, desert. in the ancient days, traveling is hazardous. Um, you could be walking in a desert for, for a month not seeing anybody except skeletons on the sand, on, on the, on the molehills. So that's what it is. This person, he translated, this person stayed in India for 17 years, learned Buddhism and became a national teacher of India. The king made him, rank him as the national teacher because he won the, all the debates in India and became the national teacher. The king didn't want him to, to return to, to China. But because of his preservation, the king finally conceded to it that maybe he should brought Buddhism back to, to, to China. So the king gave him a troop when he traveled, he traveled alone. When we returned back to China, he was given a, was given a whole troop expedition, like an expedition. Elephants carrying sutras, soldiers protecting the way. And this monk specialized in the study of consciousness. In the Sanskrit language, we call it Vujnana Matrata, the study of consciousness. And there are eight schools in Buddhism. One of the most resourceful, um, and we can also say it's quite profound, is the study of consciousness. 
Uh, we have been talking on it for months, and now we continue. So right now we are talking on the first five consciousnesses. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. We have eight consciousnesses, but we concentrate in the first five. And these are the topics that we cover. The perceived world, how do our eyes, ear, nose, tongue, body get in contact with the world? And we study the perceived world, the objects. We also study the modes of knowledge. As far as the, the perceived world is concerned, there are, there are three perspectives in which we perceive the world. Is the, the real reality of the world, a distorted reality, an illusion. Those are the three boundaries. We see things as they are, that's reality. This is an apple, this is an orange. This, I see things as they actually are. And the second one is we see things with, with what? With our own glasses with our own tainted mind, with our own bigotry, with our own egoistic feelings. That's a distorted reality. The third is illusion. We see things purely in an illusion, imaginary. It, we imagine things. But these are the three worlds, objects that we perceive, all comprising in this. The second is the most of knowledge. How do our consciousness get to know things, get to know the perceived world. So what are these three? Knowledge, how do we believe in it? How do our senses believe in it? How do your consciousness get to understand and know? Three modes of knowing, three modes of believing. The third is the moral nature. Everything we perceive, all the conclusions we make from perception has three moral natures in it. From the morality side, it's either wholesome, unwholesome, or neutral. It's either good, bad, or neutral. And then the realms of its activities. How do our consciousness, where do our consciousness work? How are they active? Where are they active? And the first five consciousnesses are active in this world of desire. Your eyes, your nose, your ears, your tongue, your body, they're active. And in a higher level up world without desire, only three are active in the first ground. I don't know if you remember. In the first dhyana, the nose and the tongue, you don't need them anymore because they don't take food. Meditation is their food. The lower level take mouthful food. We eat mouth by mouth. But the higher level existence sentient beings, they don't live by the food that we ate. You know, the food we take in and consume is coarse food. We need to excrete it into dirt. But in a higher level existence, they don't need that kind of food. Samadhi is their food. They don't need excretion. They don't need toilets, washrooms. They don't need those. Only we need them. A higher level existence, they don't need them. Is that amazing? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of existence that they don't need any toilets? They don't need to, to rent a toilet or to, to construct a toilet. No, they don't need that. Only lower level need that, we need that. And um, realms of its activities. And then these we already have discussed. Where are they active? Where are they active? How are they active? Why are they active? Now, today, we'll be touching on something that would be quite interesting if you study psychology. We study number five interactive mental functions. You see, Buddhism is not about just worshipping, eh? prostration, blind faith and belief. It's about studying your consciousness about yourself. Okay? Interactive mental function is today's topic. 
how do our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body interact with mental functions inside of us? This is what we're doing. Whenever our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body interact with the perceived world, outside world, not just the eyes function. At the same time, in your store consciousness, which is the eight consciousness, all these mental functions would work together with what the eye perceive, what the ears listen, what the tongue tastes, what the nose smell. So in other words, if we call the eight consciousness are the kings, the eye consciousness one of the kings, ear consciousness one of the kings, nose and all that, the five first five kings, all these first five kings, they have what? They have ministers to help them to perform, to speak. What are these ministers? We call them concomitant mental functions. Now, in order to know these concomitant mental functions, you need to know what are everything, everything in the world, how do we perceive them? Well, about 700 years after the demise of Buddha, after the Nirvana of Buddha, there was um, a monk, a, philo a, prof a philosopher, and his name is Asanga. Asanga study consciousness. If you can get into Google, A-S-A-N-G-A, -A -A, Asanga. Asanga was in deep meditation and he study which not a and he was, he was in contact with the Buddha of Happiness. What is this Buddha of Happiness, remember? What's the name of Buddha of Happiness? Maitreya Buddha. Maitreya Buddha was in this second level of heaven teaching Mujnaramachuta. He was in contact with him. And he invited Maitreya Buddha to come down to speak on consciousness. And Maitreya Buddha, after Maitreya Buddha have spoken, I don't know for how long, Asanga compiled Maitreya Buddha's knowledge of consciousness into a sastra, which is passed down up to now. It is called Yogacara Bhumi. Sastra. Yogacara, you know how to spell Yogacara? You can always Google that in Y O G A. Go yo, Yoga Chara Bhumi, B H U M I, Bhumi, Rams, the Rams of Yogacara uh, Sastra. There was a book like that, a hundred volumes. And that became the origin of our world's study of consciousness. And in the in that sastra, Maitreya Buddha analyzed every element of the world into 660 elements. So in other words, what we see, what we hear, everything about the world, everything includes what? I don't know what to say. Include everything. Include all the casual forces, all the elements, all the events, all the things we see, we listen, we hear, whatever the mind can conceive. That's everything. It also it includes whatever the mind cannot perceive. It, it becomes inconceivable. It, that book, that says to classify everything, if I can say everything, quote and unquote, because everything means so much. It means things that you can perceive in your mind, out of the perception, beyond the perception, it's already included in there. So into 660 dharmas. D H A L M E S, Dharmas. What is Dharma? Dharma means everything. Every force, casual force, every element, every molecule, every proton, every electron, everything you can think of into 660 elements. But then, too much for us. Later, there was a philosopher who classified into, into 100 Dharmas. Into 100 Dharmas. And whoever studied which not a Matrata, study the 100 dharmas. If you don't study the 100 dharmas, the book on 100 dharmas, there's no way you understand which Naramachata. So this is the time now to introduce to you the 100 dharmas of the world. 
the whole world is categorized, classified into 100 dharmas. What's the meaning of dharma? dharma? Dharma means everything. Things that you can think of, things that you cannot think of, which the Buddha talked about, all included in the 100 dharmas. It was 660 before. Now, they simplified it into 100 by a later philosopher. And let's take a look at the 100 dharmas in which they include the mental functions that I'm going to talk about today. So this school of thought is very complicated. It's very profound. Um, it takes many, many years to, to study it. I'm just simplifying it for you. And more and more universities get into this school. Um, in, uh, right now, in Harvard, Yale, Columbia, they all study, in, in the faculty of Buddhism, they all study the consciousness school. And that's the school where, have to, where they have the most translations. So luckily, if you get into Google, you can get a lot of, not a lot, but enough information for you to understand about the Yogacara school. Sometimes they call it consciousness school. All right, okay, get back to the Dharmas. In order to understand one of the items, that, the topics that I mentioned about the concurrent mental functions, you have to take a look at the 100 Dharmas in which they include this concurrent mental functions in our consciousness. Why do we have to study it? Because that is in your consciousness, in my consciousness, that we don't know about. You don't know that you have those things in your consciousness. You may not know. It just happened to you. Something that you ne never thought of. It just happened to you that you have those. Let's take a look at it now. I don't know how to call it. All things in the universe, I don't know how to call it. Because it includes things that you can perceive, things that you cannot perceive, things that is in your mind, things that's outside of your mind. So I don't know how to call it. I just like call it all things in the universe. All things in the universe can be divided, simplified into two categories if we can. Sometimes we can, but for the sake of understanding, we have to categorize it, classify it into two. The condition and the unconditioned. We call it the conditioned dharmas and the unconditioned dharmas. What are conditioned dharmas? The condition is that which has been created by causality. What is the meaning of causality? You should understand. You've been studying Buddhism for many years now. All the condition is created by causality. There's a cause to it. There's an effect to it. Well, whenever there is an effect, there must be a cause leading to that effect. So cause and effect, what is in between? Conditions. There must be conditions to bring that cause into an effect. There's no denying it about it. There's no question about it. It's so scientific. You cannot refute it. You don't study for the exam, that's the cause you fail. You take the course and you don't go to the lectures, you don't do anything, you fail. There wouldn't be anything like, I, I, take, I, I, I take a course at, at UBC, I don't go to lectures, I don't attend anything, I just register for it, and you get an A, <laughs> no such thing. So there's a cost leading to an effect. But in, in, in it, there must be conditions, there is causality. You, if you don't know anything about causality, I can't explain it now, I don't have time. It takes a few hours to explain causality. Um, so the condition is created by causality. The four dharmas arising, always, duration, and impermanence are the characteristics of conditioned things. In other words, all conditioned things or events or causal forces, they always have these four characteristics. Arising, becoming, producing, creating, getting old, Getting senior, sustain for a while, they, they, get, they sustain for a while, and they get old, and then they die. It happens to humans, it happens to all things. A tree, an apple, they are arising, sustaining, changing, disintegrating. Always have this, we call it the cycle. We call it the cycle. Everything is subject to this cycle, and we call it impermanence. 
And they are subject to causality, changeability, impermanence, and samsara. There's nothing that does not change. Nothing in this world does not change. You cannot look for things that is not changing. You cannot look for things that is not dying. You cannot look for things that are always living eternally. No. So anything that is that is conditioned dharmas. Unconditioned. The unconditioned has neither cause nor result. They are not subject to causality. They are not subject to changeability, impermanence, samsara. The unconditioned lasts eternally in its own nature. Now these require some time a deeper understanding in order to know. Because on the one hand, you're talking about impermanence. On the other hand, you're talking about something permanent. Are you contradicting yourself? Yes, if you don't understand unconditioned dharmas. When we talk about consciousness, let's stick our understanding in these. Let's understand the world first. Let's understand what we can perceive first. And let's understand what is in our mind first before we understand something that is beyond our intelligence, beyond our mind. And that is something beyond. For a newcomer, you may ask a question that may be in your mind. How does it help me? <laughs> you mean Buddhism is like an academic course? How does this help me? How does it help me if I know condition, if I know causality, if I know changeability, if I know impermanence, how does it help me, right? Think about it first. Ask question at lunch. How? Let's get more details. A hundred dharmas can be classified into five kinds. In the whole world, can be classified into five kinds. What are these five kinds? You said we have conditioned dharmas and unconditioned dharmas. And we want to study first the conditioned dharmas. So we have consciousness, we have forms. In other words, consciousness is not material, it's spiritual. You can't touch it. Can you touch consciousness? You can feel it, you cannot touch consciousness, right? Form is something you can touch, material. So you are studying the physical. This is the physical, this is the metaphysical. What is metaphysical? It's beyond the physical. Metaphysical is something you can only feel, you cannot touch. Can you touch energy? Can you touch your happiness? Can you touch your happiness? Can you touch your sadness? Can you touch your depression? Can you touch your greediness? Can you touch your jealousy? Can you touch your hatred? You can, but they exist. They're metaphysical. They exist and you have to study them. Why are you depressed? Why are you jealous? Why are you greedy? Because you don't study them. You don't understand them. You just suffer from them. That includes me, not just you. We all suffer from our own consciousness that we don't know about. Now, the Buddha said, don't do that. You have to study and understand it. If you just know how to meditate and you don't know how your mind works, what's the use of meditation? Meditation is to know your own mind, not just sitting there and relax and doing nothing and saying, oh my, I'm my good, good health because I meditate. No, that's not the purpose of meditation. The purpose of meditation is to get enlightened, to be a Buddha, not just getting good health. What's the point of getting good health after 100 years you still have to die? The Buddha said, Look for eternity. Look for non-death. Look for the unconditioned. So we have consciousness, form, and then what do we have? Concomitant mental functions. And then what do we have? We have dharmas, neither form nor mental functions. This are the four. And then there's a final, the six unconditioned dharmas. This is beyond what the mind can conceive. There's a sixth unconditioned dharmas beyond what the mind can. Now I got 94 in here, right? So we have eight consciousnesses, 51 concomitant mental functions, and 11 form, and 24 that is not associated with the mind. So in other words, eight 
51 and 11, these are associated with the mind. The mind understand. The mind work with them. The mind are one with them. But this is outside the mind. We have 24 things or dharmas that is outside our mind that we don't know of. Now we should know about them. Not to say the six unconditioned ones. Even the condition 24, we don't know. Now we want to study them in detail. Get to know them. If you get to know these 100 dharmas, you get to know your mind. When you get to know your mind, what happened? Think about this, ask this question. When you know about your mind, your own mind, that means you know other people's mind. Then what will happen to you? Will you live a happier life? Or you, you live a sad life? A life of suffering? You think about these questions. We like to raise these questions. Consciousnesses, we said, this is something that is our consciousnesses. We have eight consciousnesses that you should know now. But let's get to them. Body and mind. Body is material. It's body cells. Mind is it, it's perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. In common English. And, there's, and then we have sense organs. Eyes. When I see objects, the vision consciousness is produced. When ears listen to sound, audition consciousness is produced. When no smell, olfaction consciousness is produced. When tongue tastes, taste consciousness is produced. When body keep in touch, tactile touching consciousness is produced. We also have the mentality, which we call the mano consciousness. We also have the ego consciousness, which we call the manas consciousness. We also have the store, storehouse for all our energy inside of us. So we have these eight consciousnesses. We already have studied them in detail. So I'm not going to, I'm just to remind you. So these are within the 100 dharmas. Within the 100 dharmas, the eight consciousnesses that you and I have. Do you understand them? Do you understand your own eyes' vision? Do you understand your, e or your audition? It, how do you use your, your auditory consciousness? How do you use your eyes' consciousness? Do you use them correctly? Do you use them so that you'll be away from suffering? How do you use your ears? Do you, your ear, do you use your ears to listen to criticism that you get hate at? Do you get your, your, your eyes to look at things that is not right? We already have talked about those. So these are the eight consciousnesses. All right, that, let's go on to the next one. Forms now, material, 11. 11 dharmas. Eight, eight dharmas is consciousness dharmas. 11 is form. They are dharmas related to all matters and substances that are perceptible to the sense organs. They are physical existence and are regarded as outward manifestation of consciousness. How do your consciousness manifest them without forms, without molecules, without protons, without electrons? You're living in a space, then you're living, if there's no objects, how do you know your consciousness? How do, you, how, how do your consciousness seek manifestation? It's through forms. Without forms, you don't know your consciousness because there's such thing as consciousness. Imagine there's no sound, no, no objects. What is this? How do you manifest the consciousness? How do you know you have a consciousness? So in other words, they work, they work hand in hand. They work together. Now, eyes is form. Here we said the sense or eyes. Your eyes is make up of what? Body cells, the nerves, the flesh, the blood, the water. Object is what your eyes see, everything. Whatever you can see, I can see you. You are my object. You are also form. You are also material. Whatever the eyes see, it must be material so that you can see, right? Can you see something that is not material? Can I see your thinking now? I cannot because that's not material. 
if you express your thinking in words, I read those words, then I can see what you think because you expressed it on, on, in words. So the eyes can only see objects. So this is one dharma, the, eye, the, the eyes organ, the objects, ears, the ears, drum, eardrums, the flesh and blood, you, you got, everybody got ears. Ears respond, interact with what? Sound. Sound is form. Sound is frequency. If you have the minute energy consciousness, you can even see sound is material. Can you see sound? You can't. Because your eyes are not good enough. Our eyes are not good enough. Our, our ears are not even good, are not better than a dog's ears. A dog can hear five miles away. We can only hear one mile. An eagle can see 20 miles away. Our eyes can only see limited appearance. Don't think, don't, don't talk to me as if you say, I can hear, I cannot hear any sounds, so those sounds don't exist. There's a lot of sounds in here that you can hear, the frequencies. So these are material, sounds is material, it's form. Nose, smell. Of course, you know smell is its form. It's a transmission of odor, it's form. Tongue, taste, body, touch. So we have, you have 10 now, you have 10 material. And these are all inclusive. As far as materiality is concerned, can you give me anything that is outside these scopes? In other words, can you tell me, hey, there's something that you forget to put in? Or there are other things that should be within this scope that the Buddha forgot about. Everything is in there. Objects already include everything. Not only object, even the sound, even the smell, even the taste. The body, of course, get in touch with tangible object. Body means touch, right? Do you have any other material that the Buddha has not included? You tell me. You must be wiser than the Buddha if you have. But this is not inclusive. The Buddha said this is not inclusive. There are, there are more that you don't know about that is material. What are these? Forms included in Dhamma Ayatthana. What are these? A substance, substantial smallest atom. So the Buddha, the Buddha knows about atom. 2,600 years ago. The finest things that the, you cannot see. But they are still material. Now scientists can see it with microscope experiments and, you know, what not. Atoms. And the Buddha said, atom is not the smallest. There's also the unsubstantial form. And now the scientists say they're protons, electrons, neutrons, but they are still material though. You can see them, but they are still material. These are the forms included in the Dharma Ayatthana. That means you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot feel, but they are still classified as material. But we humans, we cannot see them. Our eyes are limited. Our ears, our nose, our senses are all limited. There may be some animals who can see atoms, or protons, or electrons, or neutrons, I don't know. What else? What else that we cannot see, but they are, we cannot hear, we cannot feel, but they are still regarded as material, as told by the Buddha. Next. Perceptible form conceived ordination in the most impression. This is something that is difficult to explain. An ordination of a monk, when that monk wants to become, when that layman wants to become a monk, he's an ordination. 
and he has to go through a lot of ceremonies in order to be ordained as a monk. And during the process, he has to be taught how he visualized doing the ordination. It's not just a kneel there and people perform this ordination for him. He has to meditate, visualize at why he become a monk, how he will be enlightened, where is he going, what is enlightenment, what is nirvana. He'll be given method of perception and if, when he apply that perceptible method, he would, he would tap into his inner consciousness. And the sutra consider that as material too. This is difficult to comprehend. But it is sufficient at this point to understand up to that point. Next, a momentary elusive form. Um, that includes a lot. Let's give an example. If I'm driving on a desert, all dry, no water, and because of the reflection, I'm driving on the road on the highway, and I, and I saw a mirage. I saw water in there. It, they're like a water, they're like a wave of water in there. I thought that's water. That's not water, that's just a mirage. It's just a reflection. But I see it as water. That to the mind is material. It's, but it's an illusion. It's an elusive material form. And Maitreya Buddha include that in material. And also in your dream. In your dream you're eating. In your stream, you still smell, oh, this is nice coffee, oh, this is nice steak, this is nice pop chop, oh, I have a good lobsters. Oh, um, in your dream, you have a lot of materials in your dream. You live in a big mansion. And you have all kinds of dreams that you dream of material. You're driving a Ferrari because you're dreaming for a Ferrari. That's in your dream. There's material in your dream. Next, a form produced by meditation. In a deep meditation, there is a form in meditation. That's the reason why if you really reach to a very high level of meditation, you can appear in two places, three places. In other words, I'm here, but I'm in Langley talking, talking about Buddhism in the temple in Langley, but I'm here. You understand what I mean? This is inconceivable. A person can, can, can appear in a few places. But don't get tricked by magician though. There's a real thing. That is materiality derived from meditation. Don't tell me who can prove it. Maybe in the future, someone can prove it. It has been proven by many stories. Um, one of the venerable masters, 1,000 years ago, our venerable masters in our lineage of meditative meditation, um, he was locked in jail because the magistrate, the, the district magistrate, thought that he was not talking Buddhism he was going wild, that monk. And they locked him in jail. And he was staying in jail. But he appeared in the market talking about Buddhism. And there's officers who were patrolling around and say, hey, how, he was in jail, how come he was talking? So he went back to jail and checked whether he was out of jail. He was in jail. But he'd appear in two places. That one is the monk Bao Ji, Bao Zhi Chan Si, Bao, the venerable master Bao Ji could appear in two places at the same time. All right, now this is form. So time is up. I haven't really talked about concomitant mental functions, but you really have to know about this 100 dharmas before you know concomitant, concomitant mental functions in our mind. All right, so let's uh, finish at this point. If you have any questions, you can ask at lunchtime.